one of the things we know from research in psychology, as well as just practical matters in the conducting of scientific experiments, is that one of the lowest forms of evidence you could possibly invoke is eyewitness testimony. <laughs> which is odd because it's one of the highest forms of evidence in the court of law, which disturbs me greatly. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you come from a lab to a science conference and say, this is true, we say, how do you know this? Because I saw it. Well, that's really the end of your talk. And you just leave. <laughs> and then we say, come back when you have a chart recorder or you have to just give me something that does not have to flow through your senses. Because your senses is some of the worst data-taking devices that exist. And science did not achieve maturity, modern science did not achieve maturity until we had instruments that either extended our senses or replaced them. And Galileo, it's not an accident that we have modern science, as I've described it, uh, experiment, verification, this, these tactics, these methods and tools began with Galileo and Francis Bacon, and Galileo was around 1600. That was the invention in that period of the microscope and the telescope. So it's not an accident that all this sort of came together at that time. So now we have people who are in the act of dying, and they come back from life, and they report on mental experiences. And that's intriguing. It, it's intriguing. Um, but because it is in the realm of eyewitness testimony, you can establish it perhaps as a personal truth, but it will take more than that to establish it as an objective truth. And an objective truth is the kind of truths that science discovers. And it's the kind of truth that is true whether or not you believe in it, okay? It exists outside of your culture, your religion, your political affiliation. Personal truths, if I may consider that, would be, okay, Jesus is your savior. That's your personal truth. You cannot convince someone else that Jesus is their savior in an objective way. You have to persuade them, you have to persuade them in some, with, uh, in some cases by war, right? Look at the wars that have been fought between religions that did not agree about who was their respective saviors. So, so, um, Sure. We, Hold I, on, we if, I, if I walked on water, made you unblind, turned, got created loaves and fishes out of nothing. That would be amazing. I think. And we would like investigate that. Mm. And we would we would say, whoa. <laughs> Let, yes. We would we would so it would be an amazing thing. And then if we if we cannot account for that for by any other known laws of physics, and it's only happening with you, that. When we'd see, we'd wonder if you were like alien or something first, right? <laughs> but no, it would be so easy to demonstrate divinity if in fact you had the power you wanted to display. Mm -hmm. But getting back to the gentleman's point, um, so part of this issue is what does it mean to be dead? Okay, it used to be did you fog a mirror that was held up in front of you while you were laying there on your bed, all right? And if you didn't fog the mirror, you were judged to be dead. They would put you in a coffin, and in some parts, it is told, there's a string that they put into the coffin as they buried you, and they put it over a tree branch and connect it to a bell. If you woke up, <laughs> you would pull the string, and you, that's where you get the term dead ringer. Okay, you would pull the string and you come rescue me because you buried a living person, okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> then it was you're dead because your heart stopped. Well, we know why a heart beats, it's electrochemical. So you do, -chunk, the heart beats again, we got that one. Okay, well, is it when you're brain dead? Well, you can be brain dead, but your heart is still beating and you, we can keep you alive. Are you dead yet? Well, no, because your heart's still beating. Is your brain functioning? No. Okay, I can tell you this, that if you're dead long enough so that your brain is deprived oxygen, and then you, we bring you back, you're not talking about seeing any lights because you're brain dead, okay? So, plus, this often happens to someone who is deathly ill to begin with, and where are they? They're in a hospital. And if they go into cardiac arrest or something critical, 
they take you from your hospital bed to an operating table. And what is sitting above an operating table? Lights. Bright lights. Okay? And so if you say, oh, I was dead and I came back and I saw lights, we, maybe it's not all the cases, but it's many of the cases. Okay? Now, there were skeptics who tried to do an experiment. There are people who say they left their body mm. and they saw we got some of those. Montesquieu. So here's what they When was Montesquieu? He got rear-ended by some guy in a horse, fell off, flew up into the air, looked down at himself in agony, watched his wife Wait, come over. Wait, they had rear-end collisions in the era of Montaigne, horses? Montaigne, Montaigne, sorry, Montaigne, not Still, Montaigne. they had rear-end collisions in the era of well, horses? Well, you ride a horse with a guy behind you who's riding too fast, it's like a cab situation. Okay, I didn't know that, okay. <laughs> Okay, so I, I didn't know that. Well, <laughs> I love stopping you mid. -sentence. Rear end collision <laughs> with the horses. Uh, where was I? So, so there was an experiment. So there's some descriptions that are part of this near death experience uh, um, uh, literature where they come above and they see themselves down there on the bed. Okay, so what they decided to do is for people who are about to die, they would write a message facing upwards to the ceiling above the bed and suspend it there. So if a person goes above their bed and looks down, they'd be able to read the message. So when they rejoin their body, they, want, they should then tell us what message they saw. That's never happened. It's just... <laughs> no. That's a no. Now, now, I have a cousin who... When her father died, was alone with him in the room, and he's in an open casket. And she's otherwise completely rational, okay? I'm not saying this is a crazy person. To, completely, she's a real estate agent, uh, 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 so, okay? Speaks for itself. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Among other, ta okay. So she's in there. She tells me of a conversation she had with her dead father. And I said, was it in your mind? No, he sat up and spoke to her. I said, what was the conversation? And she said, well, we, he asked, he said, don't worry about him, he's in a better place, this sort of thing. So, this is her eyewitness testimony. I'm not gonna say it's wrong, I'm just saying it's not scientifically useful. That's all I'm really saying here, okay? I told her, next time this happens, <laughs> Ask these questions and not those questions, okay? <laughs> Don't say, are you happy? Uh, uh, did you, how you, no, say, are you wearing clothes? <laughs> Where are you? Where did you get your clothes? What temperature is it? Are you, just ask questions. Like, this is, this is an amazing scientific experiment you could be performing. So, so. That's my lesson to all of you, that if you find yourself in that situation, okay? Because uh, if, if a dead person sits up and starts talking to me, oh my God, <laughs> my, my iPhone is coming out, I'm getting chart recorders, I'm, I'm gonna be all up in that as an experimenter, okay?